and incumbent Republican Howard Markline and Democrat Maureen May Grimm join me now. And I want to start with a very topical question for you. Representative, we'll start with you. As we just heard just a few weeks ago, Land's End in Dodgeville, a uh, big employer in this district that we're talking about. They announced plans to lay off some 200 workers. Some of those folks will find jobs within the company. Of course, others uh, out of luck here. How do you, and I don't know to what extent your role can be, but how do you try to create a situation where those jobs can be replaced, maybe in the short term, or just in general, how do you continue to add jobs in your district? Land's End's a huge employer, as you mentioned, in our district. The economic footprint goes from one end of, a, of my mm -hmm. district to the other, and uh, it's provided substantial uh, incomes for our families uh, in the area for, for many, many years. Uh, in terms of what we do, I guess I've been working with the uh, Southwest Wisconsin Workforce Development Board. Uh, they've had um, sessions uh, in the area to help employees uh, improve their skills, look for other opportunities, and, uh, and hopefully the, the uh, Southwest Wisconsin Workforce Development Board is also working with Land's End, uh, trying to uh, keep as many of those people that uh, are or will be laid off uh, in other positions in the, in the uh, company. So you know, hopefully as many of those people will find other jobs either at Land's End or uh, someplace else in the community. But uh, jobs are a huge, huge issue in, in our current economy. Ms. May Grimm, how would you, what would your plan be and, and what, what are some of the things that, if elected, you can do to create a better job climate in your district? Well, I used to work at Land's End, so many of the people impacted I know personally. Um, one of them I already reached out through another person to help refer her to a job at IBM that hopefully will work out for her. Mm -hmm. She's in IT. But it's, uh, many of the people impacted have been working 20, 30 years on the phones. And as we know, a big reason for this downshift is because people aren't calling in orders anymore. They're ordering over the internet. Technology is changing. So these folks are gonna need retraining, quite possibly, to enter the jobs that are needed today. And we've had significant cuts, 30% to our vocational schools. That's a problem. And we need to invest in that so people that are hit with this can get the retraining they need to meet today's jobs. And, and uh, Representative Markline, I want to give you the opportunity to kind of respond to the cuts in the in tech school training because that's been something that a, a lot of candidates we hear about. Mm -hmm. um, that we, everybody talks about tech job training, and then but at the same time we're cutting funds to that. What can we do? I mean, what what what's the? I guess it's kind of a catch twenty two. But how do you uh, how do you deal with that? Right. Well, the cuts to the tech college uh, budgets were. Uh, the state funding of our tech colleges is a very small part of the technical college budget. So mm -hmm. when, when the state part was cut by 30%, that uh, translated into about a 4 or 5% actual cut in reduction in the uh, revenues to the tech colleges. So it wasn't quite as dramatic as the 30% that's been talked about okay. uh, frequently. But you know, tech colleges, I think, and I've, I've talked with Southwest Tech uh, in, in Fenimore uh, with their president, and. One of the things we need to, to do, I think, is reprioritize, reallocate resources as much as possible. Um, our tech colleges, like a lot of our institutions, need to uh, reinvest in themselves and, and, and change priorities um, um, based on the, the current needs uh, in our, in our uh, communities and our, our, um, our job situations. Ms. May Graham, I don't know if you wanted to respond before we move on to the next topic or oh, add anything go to ahead that. And okay. Um, tough summer, of course, for farmers. I mean, uh, and a lot of it beyond anybody's control. Obviously, the weather played a huge role. Crops are in bad shape. For some, it's a total loss. Now, in a bust year, does the state have any responsibility to support them? And we'll start with you, Ms. May Graham, on this. What role, I guess, you know, obviously budget constraints are there as well. What role can the state play to help farmers in a situation where they're dealing with the drought and, and big losses like we've seen this year? Well, hopefully they had insurance to cover it, but some people didn't or didn't have enough insurance, and we do need to support our farmers at this difficult time. They support us year after year. I grew up on a farm. When I was 14 years old, that farm was sold on the courthouse steps. And that was the first of a string of many farm sales back in the late 70s and early 80s. I've been talking to people who are concerned that that's going to repeat itself right now, that farmers are hurting so badly because of the price of feed, they have to decide whether to buy feed or sell their livestock. And we need to help them. Our, our food supply needs to be supplied by a diverse group of people. It should not be in the hands of a few, and we need to be sure that that stays that way. Representative Markline, you, you want to add to that? And, and obviously we're talking about a very rural district here, a lot of farmers <coughs> that you represent. I'm a, I'm a farm boy. I was raised on a farm. I live on a farm. Uh, I know when uh, times are tough when a neighbor calls up and says, uh, Howard, can I mow your waterways for feed for my cattle, uh, which is what uh, happened uh, 
early, earlier this year. Uh, I stay in touch with my farm constituents. Uh, I'm uh, endorsed by the Farm Bureau. I, I'm out there a lot meeting with, with our farmers. And you know what the state can do, I think, as much as possible is try to um, work with the federal government, the CRP, that's all a, a federal program. And to the extent that they can, uh, we can uh, try to convince the, the feds to relax some of the, the rules on CRP and grazing and all that. I, I think, uh, think we did. Um, and we just need to be there, be sensitive to, to their needs. I mean, it's, you're right, it's tough, it's tough. And I, farmers typically are, do not complain. And I got a lot of calls uh, this summer from farmers that um, they're hurting and yeah. uh, we need to be sensitive to their needs. No question, uh, it's been a rough year. The weather was not very cooperative. Representative, how about Act 10? Um, obviously, mm -hmm. it's in the news constantly and maybe too much because I know there are other thing, a lot of other things that deserve attention that's being worked on at the Capitol. But regardless of the court decision, you know, it's in the courts now. How do you handle that if a new legislature, when things start here in a few months, uh, if they want to revisit that law? Well, the Act 10, uh, you know, it's in the courts. There's not much that, as a legislator, I can do about uh, the court action mm -hmm. at, at right. this point. But, you know, with Act 10, when I, I was elected two years ago, and in December of 2010, I was invited in to sign up as a new state employee. And I signed up for the health insurance, and I was told that my health insurance premium was $89 a month for Cadillac health insurance. I didn't have to pay a dime to the retirement system. And when I left that meeting, something just didn't seem right. So, you know, the provisions re um, which require the contribution to the retirement plan and to the, uh, the health insurance, um, people may not like that, but I think it's fair. I think it's fair to the, to the taxpayers that, that are paying the bills. So, you know, um, Monroe's uh, school district saved over $800,000 by switching uh, insurance carriers uh, this year for their health insurance from the WEA Insurance Trust. And, you know, I think that the pendulum had swung for many, many years where local school boards didn't have a whole lot of, of uh, input control. Um, and I, th I think there needed to be an adjustment back where local school boards and administrators um, had some more flexibility to, to manage their cost. And like with the insurance premiums <coughs> in Monroe, that didn't add any value to our students. And we need to reduce the overhead and drive as many of our resources into the classroom as we possibly can. Ms. May Grimm, Act 10, will you want this revisited from a legislative standpoint after the courts deal with it? I certainly will. And, and I want to talk about the, the school board's role in this. I'm on the school board, as you know, mm -hmm. second term school board member, and I was on the negotiations committee. In Mineral Point, last year we were cut over $400,000. We only realized half of that savings, and the reason for that is because our board had successfully negotiated moving from a, a more expensive to a less expensive insurance plan a few years back. Our teachers on family plan were already paying 10% of their premium. So to say that school boards didn't have the ability to do this, they needed to use that ability. You need to be a tough negotiator, as I was, and I will be. Um, the other thing is teachers and, and union workers were willing to give up those concessions. They just wanted to keep their right to collective bargaining, and even that was shut down. It's left school boards kind of in this quandary. You know, you want to have your employees have a voice. How do you do that now in this new world? And uh, I, I'm very proud to say that in Mineral Point, our teachers have still have a voice and they have thanked the school board for still recognizing them and having them be part of the process as much as possible. But it's left us in confusion. Well, finally, uh, before, as we wrap up our discussion here, I, I just want to, both of you seem like reasonable people as I met you today. How do you, how, how a voter out there who maybe is new to your district in the last few years, what separates the two of you? And we'll start with Ms. May Grimm. How are you different and what maybe why should people vote for you? Well, first I want to talk about how we're alike. Howard and I are both good people. We're both hard workers. I'm sure you've been to doors where people have said, oh, yes, I met Maureen, and I've been to doors where they met Howard. Um, and that's a good thing, that we're both getting out there and talking to voters and having that personal contact. Where we're very different is on policy and how we believe things should be. We have different perspectives on that. And school is a... Education is one of our biggest differences. As a school board member, I am a big proponent for public education. I've, I've seen it work well, and yes, there are some areas that need some improvement. In, but what I'd like to see is I'd like to see some of the great things we've done in Mineral Point and some of the great things they've done in Arena and school districts throughout this state 
that we are able to share those more readily and where we've saved costs, other schools can see that. They don't have to work in their own silo. What are we doing well in southwest Wisconsin that Milwaukee could learn from and, and share those ideas rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Um, Howard is a big proponent. He's actually supported large, sponsored legislation for school choice, which sounds good. It's a good <coughs> word. But it's taking money, reducing money from our public schools, sending it to these private, unaccountable voucher schools where teachers do not need to be licensed, kids with special needs do not have to be served. I have a nephew who's hearing impaired. And actually, we've had several hearing impaired kids come through Mineral Point. And we have to supply an interpreter to, to, to use sign language so they can learn. My nephew is employed at Land's End today. Very good job in the creative department. But a lot of that has to do that he had those things supplied through school to help him meet those needs. And I want to be sure kids aren't left out because they have some special need that needs to be addressed. Representative Mark Lyon, uh, along those same lines, why should you uh, be sent back to Madison by your constituents this, this term? <clears throat> well, I think my values closely align with the values of, of the uh, people that I represent. Uh, I'm a CPA. Uh, I understand uh, the state budget, the state finances. Uh, I'm a job creator. I've signed the, the front of a paycheck, not just the back of a paycheck. Uh, I know how small businesses work. I know the challenges that our small businesses are, are facing today. I've maintained a very strong relationship with our, the business community um, you know, throughout my, my uh, term so far. Um, the relationship that I like to have with our, our business community, with our employers, is I want um, to be aware of an issue before it, be, before it becomes an issue for them. So uh, I've worked closely with uh, our, our cheese industry, I've worked with other uh, businesses and expanding and, and uh, jobs are important to us. You know, we need to uh, keep uh, the pedal to the metal when it comes to job creation and, and uh, I've been there, I know how it works uh, and uh, I've got, said I've got a very close relationship with those small businesses that I think are going to be the engine of our growth in southwest Wisconsin. Well, thank you very much to both of you for joining us in studio today, and uh, best of luck to both of you on Election Day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank, thank you. you. Take care.